Hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to introduce the next invited speaker of this year's TQC, Nicole Junger-Halpern. Nicole did her uh, master's at the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics, and then she did her PhD under um, John Preskill at Caltech, and her PhD dissertation won the International Prize for the best PhD dissertation in thermodynamics. Currently, Nicole is a fellow of the Joint Center of Quantum Information and Computer Science. She also works at the National Institute for Standards and Technology and holds an adjunct position, assistant professor position at the University of Maryland. She's most well known for her pioneering works in quantum thermodynamics, and she's also the author of the book Quantum Steampunk, The Physics of Yesterday's Tomorrow, which brought this field to a broader audience. And today, she will tell us about her work on non-commuting conserved quantities in quantum thermodynamics. Nicole, the floor is yours, please. Do I need to do anything in order to share the slides? this trick in the bug, unplug it and plug it back in. Great. Thank you for the introduction and many thanks to the organizers for the invitation to speak here. Also thanks to all of you for coming. So this talk is in a sense inspired by the very name of this conference, the theory of quantum computation. To do a quantum computation we need a quantum many body system that in theory is closed. But of course in practice every quantum system is open it exchanges information and maybe energy with its environment. In this case, we might expect the system of interest to be in a state that flows to this canonical state, which is a thermal state, a fixed point of the dynamics. This beta is one over the environment's temperature to within a natural constant. This z, the partition function, is a normalization factor. And the h is the Hamiltonian of the system of interest. The system might exchange energy and particles with its environment. In this case, or for example, we might have a system of ultra-cold atoms, and some of them might be too hot, so they bounce out of their trap. In this case, the system of interest state could flow to this fixed point called the grand canonical state, which is another thermal state. The n here denotes the number of particles in the system of interest, and this mu is the chemical potential which acts similarly to the inverse temperature. We can play this game for many, many quantities that the system of interest can exchange with its environment. These quantities exchanged can be conserved globally across the system and environment composite. I'll call them charges, as we tend to in physics. They're represented by Hermitian operators that I'll denote by Q and index with A. In each of these cases, we tend to expect the system of interest state to flow to the appropriate thermal state, which is likely some exponential normalized with a partition function z. So what does this thermodynamic story, though, have to do with the theory of quantum computation? Well, quantum computation requires us to retain information about the system's initial conditions. Meanwhile, this thermal state, as I've said, is a fixed point. So as the system flows to the thermal state, it loses information about its initial conditions. So thermalization goes along with memory loss, which is a challenge for quantum computing. 
Also, from a more fundamental standpoint, thermalization, which is ubiquitous, it happens all the time around us, goes hand in hand with the arrow of time. For instance, we see this phenomenon during the coffee break. When we get a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, it will thermalize so that it comes to have the same temperature as its environment. And this flow of time accompanies the growth of entropy. Meanwhile, entropy goes hand in hand with irreversible computation. So thermalization also has a fundamental link with computation. For this reason, and perhaps others, TQC and quantum thermodynamics could do well to embrace each other. Some people in computer science or math might not be familiar with thermodynamics, but also, in fact, I find that a lot of physicists, even physicists who specialize in statistical mechanics, don't remember what thermodynamics actually is. So here's a very brief review. The thermodynamics is very simply the study of energy, the forms that energy can be in and the transformations amongst those forms. Thermodynamics developed during the 1800s, inspired by the Industrial Revolution. That's why you'll see a lot of steampunk artwork during this talk. For the first time, steam engines were driving factories, and people wanted to, to know how efficiently these engines could operate. However, the practical questions led to fundamental questions, such as why does time flow in only one direction, and how does thermodynamics relate to irreversible computation. What is quantum thermodynamics? This field encompasses a lot of big questions. One is, we know from quantum computation, for example, that using quantum resources, such as entanglements, we can perform information processing tasks, as we cannot with classical resources. Just as there are information processing tasks, there are thermodynamic tasks, such as charging batteries, and powering factories and cooling. Similarly, can we use quantum resources to enhance thermodynamic tasks? Also, we can look at a quantum system that's processing energy and other thermodynamic quantities and ask which behaviors of it can we see only in qu quantum systems? So we can help use qu quantum thermodynamics to figure out the distinction between quantum physics and classical physics. There are more questions, but for a review of this field, I recommend these two papers. They do a wonderful job of overviewing the kind of modern incarnation of quantum thermodynamics that relies very heavily on quantum information theory and has blossomed over the past decade plus. Also, there is this book that was mentioned during the introduction that I published last year that explains quantum thermodynamics in the way that I would explain it if you sat down with me over lunch and said, Nicole, what is quantum thermodynamics all about? In this talk, I'm going to focus on a topic that speaks to these two questions. Let's go back to the system of interest that we were thinking about beforehand that exchanges quantities with its environment. We said that we might well expect this system of interest to be in a state that flows to the appropriate thermal state. But oftentimes when we argue for that result, we implicitly assume that these charges, these exchanged quantities, commute with each other. This assumption until recently was almost always implicit. We pretty much never mentioned it. But one of the most interesting facets of quantum theory is the existence and importance of operators that fail to commute with each other. This existence of these operators leads to the unusual nature of quantum error correction, it leads to measurement disturbance, it leads to uncertainty relations. So we're compelled to ask, what happens in quantum thermodynamics if the charges don't commute with each other? This question over the past few years has led to a small but growing subfield that a number of people here have contributed to. My group wrote a perspective on this field for Nature Reviews Physics that you can find on the archive here. Also, if you want kind of a more narrative approach to how this started, then I can refer to chapter 12 of this book. But here's where I'd like to go in the rest of this talk. First, I'll present a simple physical example of what I'm talking about so we can get a picture in our heads. 
Then I'll talk about the physics of what changes when charges fail to commute with each other. And I'll focus in particular on an example result that involves how much entanglement, bipartite entanglement, is in a system. And I think that this little subfield has a lot of very rich opportunities for future work. But here's a simple physical example to put our, a picture in our heads. The theoretical proposal was in this paper. It was realized experimentally in the lab of Christian Roos and Reiner Blotz with trapped ions. And a generalization, theoretically, to more general systems and charges appears in this paper. So consider a chain of qubits. The system of interest could consist of a couple of the qubits, so that the whole thing consists of n copies of the small system of interest. The rest of the copies form the effective environment, so that the whole thing forms a closed quantum many-body system of the sort that has been studied theoretically and experimentally a great deal over the past several years. We should compare this picture with the picture that I presented earlier, in which we have a system of interest and some big environment, here we're basically recognizing that ultimately the environment is quantum. To introduce the charges that are natural to this system, I'll denote by sigma aj the eighth component of the spin of qubit j. To get a global charge, which is conserved, we take one of the spin components and sum it across the lattice. We need dynamics, for instance, a Hamiltonian, or even if we use a gate-based model for our dynamics, then we'll need a whole bunch of Hamiltonians to generate all those unitary gates. The dynamics should have three properties. First, the dynamics should conserve all of the non-commuting charges. Second, the dynamics should take local charges and transport them between subsystems. And third, our dynamics should be non-integrable or random or chaotic so that the state has the opportunity to explore basically all of the available Hilbert space. We can construct such a Hamiltonian in the following way. We all know the forms of the raising and lowering operators for the z component of the spin. And we can put them together to form an operator that takes one quantum of the z component of the spin from site j plus one and hops it onto site j and does the reverse in superposition. Similarly, we can form these hopping operators for the x and y type charges. To get our total Hamiltonian, we should take our hopping operators and sum them over all of the charges. Then we sum over the lattice and have a hopping frequency. You might recognize this factor as the Heisenberg interaction. This is an operator that is well known. It has been well studied for many years, although I have to say that just a few years ago it turned out to have some secrets related to transport that were you know, very unexpected. Um, so this is the Heisenberg interaction. It is realizable, it's well known, but I don't ever see it written in this way, showing that explicitly it conserves global, globally non-commuting charges and transport them locally. Also, if you want to move beyond the Heisenberg interaction and generalize this means of constructing a Hamiltonian then to many other types of systems and other sets of charges, then you can do so using the generalization in this paper. If we want to make this system, or these dynamics, very random, then we can extend the interactions beyond nearest neighbor coupling or give the lattice at least one extra dimension. Now we have a picture of the type of physical system that we want to have in mind. But what happens? What changes when conserved quantities fail to commute with each other? First, it isn't obvious that the small system of interest should thermalize for a number of reasons. And this claim should be surprising because, as we said before, thermalization is ubiquitous. It happens even during the coffee break. First, two derivations of the form of the thermal state break down if the charges fail to commute with each other. Also, the global charges, since they don't commute, don't share an eigenbasis so they don't necessarily share any eigenspace. 
It's a shared eigenspace that can serve as a microcanonical subspace, which I should review. So here's a reminder or an introduction of what a microcanonical subspace or a microcanonical state is. Let's go back to the simpler problem in which we have a system of interest and an environment exchanging just heat and particles. This problem is treated very, very frequently. Suppose that we want to find the system of interest eventually in the appropriate thermal state. What do we do? We suppose that the global system is in an eigenspace, a sector, of the global particle number operator. So the whole system has a well-defined number of particles. And we also suppose that the global system is in a state that has significant weight just on energy eigenspaces associated with close together energies. We call this subspace a microcanonical subspace. We attribute to the global system a microcanonical state. That is the projector onto the subspace normalized by the dimensionality of the subspace. We trace out the environment to get the state of the system of interest, which turns out to be the appropriate thermal state, which we said earlier was the grand canonical state if the system and the environment interact only weakly. Suppose that the system and the environment exchange more charges that commute with each other. Then a microcanonical subspace is an eigenspace shared by those charges. I mean, apart from the Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian is special and different because it generates the time evolution. But if our charges don't commute with each other, then again, they don't share an eigenbasis, so they don't necessarily share an eigenspace, or at least they don't share abundantly many. So we might not have any microcanonical subspace or many microcanonical subspaces. And if we can't even begin the argument that so often leads, that we so often take to get to the thermal state's form, then why should we expect thermalization of the small system of interest? Also, if the Hamiltonian conserves quantities that don't commute with each other, then the Hamiltonian is forced to have degeneracies by a result in group theory called Schur's lemma. And degeneracies throw wrenches in a number of arguments for thermalization. Also, if the Hamiltonian conserves non-commuting charges, then it can't necessarily obey uh, the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. Now, this is a result in many body physics, and it's arguably our best toolkit for understanding how closed quantum many body systems thermalize internally. So non-commuting charges conflict with it. So I really like this result by Iman Marvian. He considered local interactions, such as two qubit gates, that conserve some charges. And he considered combining these local gates in order to perform a global, say, n qubit unitary or n qubit. And this n qubit unitary would conserve globally the same charges. And he asked, if we put together these local unitaries, how many of the global unitaries that conserve the same charges can we implement? And the answer is, you can't implement all of the global unitaries. So the charges constrain the global unitaries implementable. And if the charges fail to commute with each other, then they constrain the global unitaries implementable, especially severely. So in some sense, we can't, uh, this might limit the randomness or chaos that is implementable globally if charges don't commute with each other. Here's another result of how the physics changes when charges fail to commute in quantum thermodynamics. The average bipartite entanglement in the system can increase. And I'm gonna focus on this result for a few minutes to present some more detail. First, how do we want to measure the average bipartite entanglement across the system? We use the page curve introduced by Don Page. Consider a system of n qubits. The whole thing we can suppose is in some pure states in Hilbert space H. We can divide the system 
into a subsystem A and a subsystem B. The system A will be in this reduced state, which has some von Neumann, some von Neumann entropy. By the way, in this talk, I'm going to be using logarithms of base E, so I'm going to measure entropies in nats or natural units, because that's what we do in thermodynamics. We can take this von Neumann entropy and average it over all of the states in this available Hilbert space. So this average is the Haar average, which we can think of loosely as uniformly random. More precisely, it's the unique unitarily invariant measure. And it models a sampling of a state across some random chaotic trajectory. We can plot this averaged entanglement entropy, SA, against NA, which is the size of the subsystem A, the number of qubits in the subsystem. So we saw what happens when we have just one qubit in the subsystem A. Then we can move our partition to the right. Suppose that A has now two qubits. We get another point on our plot. We keep moving the partition, and by the end, we get a whole page curve. So that is going to be our measure of the average bipartite entanglement in our system. Suppose that we restrict the page curve by imposing charges on the system. Well, you might argue that, in fact, there can be no charges in this problem because charges are things that are conserved. What does conserving? Dynamics. But my last slide had no dynamics on it. It just had a Hilbert space. Well, as I said, we can think of the Haar average as modeling sampling of states from across some chaotic trajectory in some Hilbert space. So we can suppose that our system is constrained to have some maybe total particle number and imagine that the dynamics move it across, move the state across that Hilbert space. The result of sampling across that trajectory will be kind of like what we get from the page curve. And in particular, we will want to constrain this subspace H to be a microcanonical subspace, at least ordinarily in previous papers. In previous literature, people found that if in this manner you impose commuting charges on the system, then the page curve decreases or goes downward. So the average amount of entanglement in the system, uh, bipartite entanglement in the system decreases because the system is more constrained. What happens if the charges don't commute with each other? So I was expecting that they would lower the page curve even more. How come? Because entanglement is a key part of quantum many body thermalization. And I presented all those slides indicating that we have these pieces of evidence that non-commuting charges seem to kind of hinder thermalization in certain ways. I was wrong. Here's what we found out instead. And oh, the fact that I was wrong will lead to a puzzle that I'll present about in the opportunities section. First, how do we even compare a system with commuting charges and a system with non-commuting charges? What we want is two models that are extremely closely analogous. Just one of them has charges that only commute with each other, and the other model has charges that fail to commute. It wasn't clear that such models could even exist, or if they did, what they would look like. But here's what we came up with. In each of our models, we have an n site system. Each site consists of a four-level qubit, or you could think of it as two qubits. I'll label one qubit on a site alpha and the other qubit beta. Each model has three charges, and all of the charges have the same spectra. In the model with non-commuting charges, each local charge associated with one site has the following form. So the first charge is an x on the first qubit, tensored with an identity on the second qubit. The next charge is y times the identity, and the third charge is z times the identity. Here are the commuting charges. They're x tensored x, 
Y tensor Y, and Z tensor Z. To get the global, globally conserved charges, we take each local charge and sum it across the sites. This is true in the non-commuting charge model and in the commuting charge model. These charges are also analogous because they generate similar algebras. Consider unequal charge indices A, B, and C. If we multiply any two non-commuting charges together, then we get I times the levi civita tensor times the third charge. Similarly, if we take any two commuting charges and multiply them together, then we get a constant times the third charge. But of course, the constant has to be different. Also, if we take any non-commuting charges, or any single non-commuting charge and square it, we get the same thing as the result of taking any commuting charge and squaring it, namely the identity. So these algebras very closely parallel each other, except one has just commuting charges and the other has non-commuting charges. A part of our model is this subspace from which we sample when calculating the page curve. What would make subspaces for the two models analogous? Well, consider taking any state from our subspace in the non-commuting charge model. Then imagine measuring any global charge. We'll obtain some outcome gamma with some probability. Now take this probability and average it across the whole Hilbert space. We get this probability distribution that I call P non-commuting, and it's labeled by the charge A that we've measured, and it's associated with a possible outcome gamma. We can, of course, define an analogous probability distribution for the commuting charge model, and these two probability distributions should equal each other for the Hilbert spaces to be analogous. An example pair of analogous subspaces is the following. In the non-commuting charge model, we take the one microcanonical subspace that exists. This is the eigenspace shared by all the global charges that corresponds to the zero eigenvalues. And in the commuting charge model, we take also the eigenvalue zero eigenspace shared by the charges. So those are the, those are the Hilbert spaces over which we'll calculate the page curves in the example I'll present here. There are also generalizations in the paper. But here are the results. I'll start with the analytics. So we calculated the page curves using the Catalan numbers, which give us the dimensionalities of subspaces of interest for qubit systems. And we use large N expansions and Gaussian approximations, especially because a lot of factorials were involved. We assumed that the system of interest A and the system of interest B had sizes that were pretty large and close to their average values. So here are the two page curves that we calculated. The page curves have this same lower order, uh, excuse me, highest order term. I'll call that L. If you want to see the exact form, I can show it later in a bonus, bonus slide. I'm omitting it here for time concerns. The next term is the interesting one. It looks the same between the two page curves, except it comes with a plus sign in the non-commuting case and a minus sign in the commuting case. And then there are smaller corrections. The difference between these two page curves is the size of the A system squared over twice the size of the whole system squared times the size of the B system squared. And remember, we assumed this so on the whole, the non-commuting charge page curve is greater by an order one over n term. So it's larger polynomially, which is good because the difference is an exponentially small. So it's only polynomial in the global system size. And since the difference is like one over n, it will approach zero in the thermodynamic limits as the whole system grows infinitely large. And this result makes sense because According to the correspondence principle, as systems grow large, they grow classical. And non-commutation is not so very, very classical, so we would expect effects to go away, effects of it to go away as the system becomes very large. 
We also have numerical results. I'll present an example in which the number of sites is eight. This number might look very small for numerics, but remember each site consists of two qubits. So the global system consisted of 16 qubits and these analogous subspaces that I described in this example exist only if um, the number of sites is a multiple of four. So the next option would have been 24 qubits, would have been, which would have been a little much for our classical computational resources used here. I'll present a plot along the x-axis. I'll show the size of the A subsystem. Along the y-axis, I'll show the contents of the page curve. So this symbol is the page curve that is calculated over the subsystem of interest, which is constrained by charges. And we're subtracting off the unconstrained page curve to focus on the difference that's given to us by the charges. And again, I'm calculating entropies in units of gnats. Here are the curves. This orange curve shows the important part of the page curve constrained by non-commuting charges, and the blue curve shows the page curve constrained by commuting charges. The orange curve is always above or on the blue curve, so the non-commuting charges endow our system with at least as much average bipartite entanglement entropy as commuting charges. The difference between these two page curves can reach 0.0797 natural units, which is 10.5% of the average of the two page curves. And my x-axis here goes up to half of the size of the total system because the page curve is symmetric about this point. You might notice that the y-axis at the top is zero and only goes negative beyond that. So both of our charge-restricted page curves lie below the unrestricted page curve. So as expected, charges in general tend to lower the amount of bipartite entanglement entropy in the system on average. So in conclusion, we see that the non-commuting charge page curve is always above or on the commuting charge page curve. So non-commuting charges allow for some extra average bipartite entanglement entropy. Why should that be the case? We're open to more possible reasons, but here is one. Suppose that we focus on the model with commuting charges. We can look at this subspace of interest and ask, what is its least entangled basis across sites? Well, the least entangled basis is, in fact, totally unentangled. It's a product basis. How come? Well, remember, this is how our whole system looks. Remember the um, forms of the, uh, this should be commuting charges. Since the charges, these are the local charges, so they correspond to one site. And since the charges all commute with each other, they share a basis for the Hilbert space of one site. So we can attribute to this site a basis, and this site another copy of the basis, and so on and so forth. And if we want to build up a basis for the entire subspace, we can just take tensor products. So indeed, this Hilbert space in the commuting charge model has a tensor product basis. We cannot do the same thing with the non-commuting model. So if we take the non-commuting charge model, we look at its Hilbert space and we ask, what is the minimally entangled basis? We find that it actually has to have entanglement. And if the minimally entangled basis has more entanglement in the non-commuting case, we might expect that on average across the whole space, we'll find more entanglement in the non-commuting case. Let's a uh, sample of one of the results in this little subfield realized recently. Here are some more that I'd really like to see. First, we now have a puzzle. We have some evidence that non-commutation of charges hinders thermalization or might in some ways, 
And we have some evidence that charges non-commutation kind of enhances thermalization in some ways. Here is the evidence in the Hinder camp. It's a review of what I went through on earlier slides. We saw that charges non-commutation break two derivations of the thermal state's form. Non-commutation of the charges conflicts with the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, our best toolkit for understanding how closed quantum many-body systems thermalize internally. Also, I really like this result. Um, if charges fail to commute with each other, then they decrease the rates at which thermodynamic entropy, as opposed to strictly entanglement entropy, is produced when you have charges flowing between two subsystems forming currents. We also saw that you can take local, say, two qubit gates that are constrained by charges and use them to implement global charge conserving unitaries. And non-commuting charges will constrain the global unitaries particularly strongly, and so we might expect constrain some elements of the chaos realizable. What about the camp of enhancing thermalization? Well, we saw that non-commutation of charges increases the average bipartite entanglement in a system. And entanglement goes hand in hand or is a very important part of quantum many-body thermalization. Also, there is a phase of matter called many-body localization that resists thermalization for long times. And so many-body localization has been proposed as kind of a, a tool for quantum memories. You can take a many-body localized system and force it to conserve charges that don't commute with each other. When you do, you destabilize this phase of matter. And so if you add just a tiny perturbation, the many-body localization is destroyed and the system will thermalize quickly. Now, these results that I've shown don't actually conflict with each other technically because they've been derived in somewhat different settings, but they still clash with each other conceptually. So I'm very curious as to whether one side will kind of win out with the other or how on the whole we can reconcile these two sets of results. Also, can we take these hints of resistance to thermalization offered by non-commuting charges and use this potential resistance to preserve information in quantum memories? In addition, we can take any phenomenon in chaos or randomness or quantum thermodynamics and ask what happens to it if the dynamics conserve charges that don't commute with each other. And lots of wonderful means of assessing randomness and chaos have been introduced and analyzed to a great extent recently in quantum information theory. In addition, now we have these two models that are very closely analogous, except that one has commuting charges only and the other has non-commuting charges. We use this pair of models to see, to nail down how does non-commutation of the charges affect average bipartite entanglement entropy? But we can ask, use these two models to nail down the effects of charges non-commutation on many other facets of quantum thermodynamics. In summary, we saw that we can take a very common setting of an open quantum system or a quantum system that is exchanging quantities with an environment that's truly quantum. We can add one little tweak that involves non-commutation of operators. Our expectations about thermalization come to break down. We saw um, a simple example of a chain of qubits in which the charges are the x, y, and z components of the spin. We talked a little bit about what physics changes. It's not clear that thermalization happens. Also, the average bipartite entanglement across the system can grow. We saw there are lots of opportunities for future work. So if anyone is interested in getting into this little subfield, then feel free to come talk to me later. So these are the two papers that I focused on most. This has the results about the page curves. 
And this is the perspective on the little subfield. However, my group has been obsessed with non-commuting thermodynamic quantities for a few years. This is all our work, and there are many more works from across the community that you can find listed in this perspective. Thanks very much for your time. Very nice and interesting talk. Uh, are there any questions? Please, we will start here. It's easy. Thank you very much, Nicole, for the very nice talk and also for yeah this cool puzzle that you were posing. Um, so one question was: so if I understood correctly, the um, this increase of the page curve for non-commuting charges. Um, so this is assuming that the the, the system can actually explore. Um, the kind of uniformly the whole non-commuting, approximate non-commuting subspace. So could it be that both things are true because um, kind of it takes just much longer for the system to explore that whole subspace so that effectively, I mean, the, the thermalization is hindered when you introduce time as a variable, but if you just look at uh, just, you know, the long time situation where the system has the time to explore everything, then the page curve would Okay, so that somehow an effective page curve would be lower, but then eventually it would get higher than the commuting case. Yeah, so the question is about the dynamics. Um, and in particular, my non-commuting charges increase the time required for thermalization. Uh, that's a question that I haven't looked into that I'm really excited to learn the answer to. Iman, Marvian group, Iman Marvian's group has started looking into that. Um, and also, you could even, um, there, there is a further way that is related to your suggestion um, that in which our page curve results um, could be altered. So on the one hand, you could just talk about the page curve without talking about dynamics and say we averaged over the whole Hilbert space, that's just a choice we made. Then you could also say, well, um, as the sampling of the Hilbert space um, via the Haar measure is intended to model sampling across a dynamical trajectory. As you pointed out, we might be interested in sampling over the trajectory over you know, a short time scale or an extremely long time scale. Um, but Iman's current results actually suggest that it's possible that this, in the presence of non-commuting charges, the system might never explore the entire Hilbert space because just local interactions constrained by non-commuting charges cannot reach the set of globally, not, uh, globally charge constrained unitaries. So I think that it would be really useful to take our results and see how it might change if we took into account Iman's results and thought even more about dynamics. Thanks, so. Any other questions here? Hi, Nicole. Thank you for the very nice talk. I wanted to ask that the non-commutativity of the charges implies some bipartite or entanglement. Do you know if the opposite is true? If, if you observe some entanglement, does it mean that, to some extent, the charges uh, don't commute? Um, so if you observe that, an entang um, let's say, a page curve is higher than expected, um, if you don't know anything about the system, then it might have charges, it might not have charges, it might just have a bigger Hilbert space than you expected. So um, there might be possibly different effects. Let's see if one more. Let's go. Let's go. Uh, thank you very much. Very nice talk, Nicole. So uh, my question is uh, for the definition of, let's say, uh, page curve. Uh, when you do it. So the partitioning of the system seems to be very uh, specific. For example, you only, uh, if you want to consider entanglement between two qubits and the rest of the system, there are different choices of two qubits, but you only consider the nearest neighbors. Can this actually, you know, uh, did, you, did you explore, for example, if we consider all possible partitioning, maybe, maybe the, 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 the uh, basically the puzzle that you uh, mentioned might, might come from that. So, I think that the geometry of the system, as in 
where are these two qubits? That would be important if we were considering a dynamics that was local. Mm -hmm. Then two qubits that were closer together would interact a lot more strongly, and that would probably affect the amount of entanglement between them, as opposed to the amount of entanglement between one of those qubits and a far away qubit. When we calculate the page curve in the way that Don Page did, we don't actually have an explicit dynamics, so we don't have a local dynamics, and so the subsystems are basically effectively interchangeable. I see. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the nice talk, Nicole. I was wondering, with this simple example where you saw that the entropy increased with non-commuting operate or uh, charges, how universal do you think that is? Like, do you think there could be a system where the non-commuting charges are kind of tailored to actually decrease entanglement? I would really like to see more models that show a parallel between a system with just commuting charges and a system with non-commuting charges so that we would have more of a sense of how universal this result is. For now, I can just say this is re the result that we have for this pair of models, which was all we could come up with after a few years of thought. Um, but I certainly hope to, um, to see in the future more parallel models. And also, this explanation that I showed, um, this kind of physical explanation as to why the non-commuting charges should allow for more entanglement because of the nature of its minimally entangled basis, um, it's possible that we could try to generalize that. Um, because, well, actually, that is, uh, it is a little more general than um, our specific model because it's not specific to uh, having an x times the identity versus an xx. Um, so that is a little bit more general, but um, it's, it's not a rigorous argument that the non-commuting charge model must have more entanglement entropy. So I think that's another avenue for trying to generalize this result. Thanks for the nice talk. Um, so I was just wondering about the origins of <coughs> when you construct the two analogous models, the commuting ones and the non-commuting ones. Um, because when I was looking at it, it looked, looked to me like the, the construction you have in, in, in a Paris Merman square. So essentially like... Uh, Sorry, the construction what? If you do like the, the Merman proof of contextuality, for example, like the two qubit proof, like the magic square style proof, how, do you know about this? Sorry, I'm having some trouble hearing. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, so I was saying that um, in your commuting model, you have, uh, so it's local commutation that you care about, right? Like, uh, and in the non-commuting model, uh, they're locally non-commuting, but of course they share um, an eigenbasis, so they're globally commuting. So what I was saying was that these appear as um, uh, commuting subsets in a proof of uh, cochin specker theorem, for example, like in the paris merman square. So I was wondering if when you came up with these two models, if you had that at the back of your mind, or is that just an accident? Because uh, th there's a technical reason why when you, when you construct these paris merman proofs of contextuality, you need entangled bases. You, you cannot actually construct them without entanglement. And those usually come from the well basis. So I was just wondering if, if that had anything to do with your choice of how you constructed these two models. That's an astute observation. We hadn't made the connection to Merman's magic square, but that could be worth looking into to see whether it can add anything to this result. We have one more here. Hi. I'm very curious about the applications as memories. Making the analogy with the optical memories, we have to write the information, uh, to read and erase. Do we have any ideas how to use these systems uh, as memories. So I, Thinking that you have to uh, fix the information, to read the information, and finally to erase the system. Again, I'm having a little difficulty hearing, but I think that the question is about um, whether we have a way to write in information to a system with non-commuting charges and use the non-commutation of the charges to preserve the information in a memory for long times. We don't have that at this point. Uh, over the past few years, we've basically been looking around, grasping at physical results to see, can we find any possible physical effects of non-commuting charges on thermodynamic properties? And now we have a little pile of physical results. And now I think definitely is the time, in addition to looking for more physical results, to try to use these results for this potential for storage of information. 
I don't see any more questions, but I want to ask one. So you showed this um, commutative versus non-commutative model. You said analogous ones with X, Y, or Z, or X, X, Y, Y, and Z. And those two models, well, okay, they are analogous. They look similar, but like one is maximally un commu commuting and one is maximally non-commuting. I was just wondering whether there could be some way of thinking of models when there is some continuous parameter that goes between commuting things to and brings like continuously epsilon non-commutativeness and then you can study maybe. Um, so did you start to think about this kind of thing? That, because this one is like really the extreme cases. Like, is there a way to, to do it smoothly? I agree, such a model would be very much desirable. We've mm -hmm. been looking for one for a number of years, so if you find it, let <laughs> okay. us know. All right, okay, last, last time to ask a question. Any other questions? All right, if that's not the case, then let's thank Nicole again.